What's going on, guys, and welcome to episode 512 here today for Hashtag Ask GSM, September 20th, 2023. I am Graham GSM Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well and having a great week so far. If you want to send in a question to the show, you can do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag Ask GSM. Find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash Graham.GSM.Matthews. Drop a comment on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. Last but certainly not least, drop a question down below in the comment section in this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. We'll get started with the YouTube questions here, including from Joanne. Their first question was, Will Baron Corbin and Jake Hager be remembered more fondly by fans once their careers finish up? In a similar fashion how Big Show and Mark Henry were, Corbin and Hager are usually met with nothing but contempt from fans of their respective companies, not too different to how Show and Henry for large parts of their careers were. Um, however, usually, or rather, obviously, Big Show and Mark Henry have had much better careers, but Big Show is remembered fondly for being a workhorse who put his all into a lot of shit that he was given over the years. Like Corbin, and Henry is remembered fondly for playing a significant part spanning years in the industry, similar to Hager in two companies. Um, Corbin, yes. Hager, no. Corbin, I think, will be remembered more fondly, not in the same way that Big Show and Mark Henry were, because like you said, Big Show and Henry were had much better careers in WWE. Um, and just in wrestling in general, than fucking Baron Corbin and Jake Hager. Corbin and Hager, I mean, I guess Hager was actually a former world champion. Uh, Henry was a former one-time world champion like Hager was. Big Show was a multi-time world champion across, you know, all three brands and whatever. Corbin has never been a world champion. At this point, he never will be. Um, unless he somehow wins the NXT championship, which I wouldn't even then count that in, uh, as a world championship personally. But um, the biggest difference, though, is that Big Show and Mark Henry were in the company for so long, and they were always involved in the main event scene. Not that Corbin wasn't. Jake Hager never really was. Jake Hager was never really an important piece of the puzzle like um, like Mark Henry, specifically Big Show. Mark Henry wasn't always in the main event scene either. Mark Henry was closer to a Hager or a Corbin in WWE before the Hall of Pain thing started in 2011. And that was 15 years after he was already in WWE. He debuted in 96. The Hall of Fame, the Hall of Pain stuff, rather, did not start until 2011, 15 years after his debut. And that was better than anything, personally, I think Corbin and Hager ever did in WWE or will continue to do. Um, I like Corbin a lot, Hager not so much, I don't really care about Hager personally, but that Hall of Pain run for Mark Henry, that alone earned him a legitimate run, like earned him a Hall of Fame ballot for WWE in the WWE Hall of Fame, uh, earned him a spot in the WWE Hall of Fame. Corbin will be in there just for his accolades alone, Jake Hager would, I would imagine, never be in the WWE Hall of Fame, I'm not really sure why he would be, I'm not, I'm not saying that's your question, but like... Hager's not like Corbin in the sense that, yeah, Corbin's been around for a lot. He's been an authority figure, won money in the bank, United States champion, a lot of different characters. He has played an important role, positive and negative, in WWE for the last seven, eight years since he's been on the main roster specifically. Jake Hager in his time in WWE uh, never really did anything close to as newsworthy or as noteworthy as Corbin. Yeah, he was world champion for like a cup of coffee in 2010. He was also United States champion for a cup of coffee in 2012, I think it was. No one remembers that. Uh, what else did Hager even really do in WWE that came close to remotely close to anything Corbin has accomplished? Beating Kurt Angle at WrestleMania, retiring him. Again, not a big fan of that call, but it was still more eventful than anything Hager really even did in WWE. Corbin, even not having been a former world champion, to me is still more successful and has had more of an impact in WWE than Jack Swagger did when he was in WWE. Because after the world title stuff ended in 2010, he was a mid-card guy. He was just another mid-card guy. He's literally, or he was literally in the Miz role. And I love the Miz, and the Miz has had a lot more success, obviously, than fucking Jack Swagger. Um... But Jack Swagger from 2010 up until 2017 when he was finally let go or left the company, whatever, he was at a certain level. I mean, in 2013, he had that brief run at the main event scene, but it was very brief. And that's about it. Corbin, to his credit, whether you like him or not, and I've always been a big Baron Corbin fan, not always a fan of what they've had him doing or what they booked him to do, um, but I think he's more interesting to watch in the ring personally. 
and has remained relevant to his credit in the last eight years on the main roster. Jack Swagger did not. Jack Swagger came on over to AEW, and you're like, you're asking, will he be remembered more fondly when he's gone? No, I don't think he will be. I honestly don't. I don't think people have missed him in WWE. Like, if he left AEW tomorrow, I doubt anyone would would be clamoring for another Jack Swagger run in WWE. It's as if he never even really left because he was barely even noticeable in the first place. And again, I'm sure he's a nice guy and everything, but I'm just spitting facts here. Jake Hager never really left much of an impact. Big Show and Henry did. They were always around. They were always relevant. Um, You know, Henry specifically was a jobber at certain points, but he was always over. He was successful, made an impact. Hager never really did. And Porter that falls in WWE, he could have been a bit bigger than he was, but they pushed him too late in 2013, and then he also just wasn't overly interesting. He just didn't have the charisma that it takes to be a top talent in that company. That was pretty evident in 2010, when he was just a world champion in name and nothing more. He didn't really have the charisma of a world champion. He didn't have any amazing matches in WWE. He hasn't really had any amazing matches in AEW. It's not like he went to w- or rather to AEW from WWE. The handcuffs were off, and he's been this big star. He really hasn't been. He's been a bodyguard for Chris Jericho, and that's really about it for the last four years. That's the extent of his run in AEW. So, Hager will not be remembered more fondly. Corbin, I think, will be. I think people are starting to kind of look at Corbin a bit differently now. People are starting to appreciate Corbin a bit more now than they have in the past. Now that he's in NXT, doing different work, ditching the characters, and he's always been good in the ring. Corbin's had a lot of very good matches with a lot of different people. Multi-man and singles across, again, all three brands. Um, Hager, I can't really... I couldn't put together a top five list of best Jake Hager matches in WWE. He had some solid matches, but no matches that I would go back and watch. With Corbin, uh, you know, the Kurt Angle match sucked. But, like, early on in his run in WWE, he had that really good three-way with AJ Styles and Dolph Ziggler for the WWE Championship. His matches with AJ specifically for the United States Championship in late 2017 were actually really good. Um, the matches with Dean Ambrose were pretty good. And I know those were years ago, so we're going back a ways here. But he's always... Like, the matches in the King of the Ring. When he won King of the Ring in 2019, the matches with Gable and everything leading up to that was excellent. What Corbin was doing at that point in the ring was awesome. But anyway, to answer your question, I do think Corbin will be remembered more fondly and already is than Jake Hager has been and ever will be. Like Big Show and Henry for, for Corbin... Jake Hager, not so much. Um, His second question, when he returns, is turning Wardlow heel the right move or would it feel like a step backwards? Listen, at this point with Wardlow, nothing is a step backwards. The guy has not been on TV for over three fucking months. Listen, he's a natural babyface at this point. When he turned babyface about a year and a half ago, it was obviously the right move. People shat on me on Twitter last week when I said that I would get the fuck out of that company if I was him follow Jade Cargill's ass to WWE because at one point in AEW he was the most overact in the entire show. This is not a fucking debate. A lot of people responded saying, what are you talking about? When when was he ever really over or the most overact? Um, He was. In the spring of 2022 going into Double or Nothing, no one was more over from week to week than Wardlow. More than CM Punk, MJF, Adam Page, the world champion at that point, or anyone else going into that pay-per-view. That is a fact. It was not sustained over six months, but he was the hottest act in that company for that short period with the way they booked him. And ever ever since he beat MJF, it's been all downhill since there. Since then, back at Double or Nothing 2022. Um, the various TNT title reigns that were completely botched that no one gave a shit about. The guy's been off the show. He's on the show. He lost his passport. Where the fuck is this guy? Like, I know he lost his passport, but... They've been in the U.S. for months now. I know they were touring Canada. They were in the U.K. for All In. There's no excuse. There's no, unless he's, like, hurt, and there's a real reason why he's not on the show and he's battling COVID or something like that. If it's a creative thing and they have nothing for him creatively, that's no fault of his own. That's an AEW issue. So anyway, bringing him back as a heel, at this point, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't even fucking matter because they've already... To me, they have ruined Wardlow. Can he be built back up? Maybe. Um, The guy's talented enough. He can be a spokesperson for that company. It's not like he's five years removed from his hottest point in 2022. We're only a year and a half removed. 
and he's not like it's not like he's 50. Like he can still rebound, whether it be in AEW or WWE. Turning heel, though, I mean, I'd have to look at the babyface heel roster in AEW, what they need more of. But if MJF's going to be a babyface for the foreseeable future, you could run back Wardlow and MJF with Wardlow as the heel and MJF as the babyface. That might honestly not be the worst thing. The problem there, though, is that you can't bring back Wardlow cold and immediately thrust him back into the world title picture. They've done that with Lance Archer before, and it did not work. Because the guy was gone for months, people saw him as a loser, they did not give a fuck. Him and Cole, or him and, uh, not Cole, Page, him and Adam Page had good matches last year, but his reactions, no one gave a fuck about the guy because he wasn't around for months. And the last time we saw him prior to that point, he was a fucking loser. So, with Ward, though, they would have to bring him back and build him up first, but I do think a babyface MJF and a heel Wardlow program could work. But I'm not advocating they turn him heel. I'm just advocating they bring the guy back to the fucking show. I mean, that, if anything, would be a step forward. Anything else, at this point, it doesn't even matter. But like I said last week, if I'm him, whenever my contract's up, whether it be at the end of this year, next year, 2025, doesn't matter. I would get the fuck out of there as soon as possible. Um, just wasted potential, in my opinion. No L from Facebook, their first question was, should Becky Lynch hold an open challenge only on NXT, since it's going to be the same names on the main roster? Now, I'm fine with her defending the... First of all, the open challenges are just fucking done to death, specifically in AEW, but because AEW has done them... And WWE has done them, has done them to death as well in the last eight years since John Cena started doing it with the United States Championship. But it's been done to death so much lately... I'm sick of the open challenge bullshit. But I'm fine with Becky Lynch defending the NXT Women's Championship on the main roster. We don't know how long this run's going to go for. I have not watched NXT last, from last night. But I did see a graphic that announced Becky and Tiffany for the title at No Mercy. And there's a pretty good chance Tiffany gets the belt back on that show. So Becky as champion might be short-lived. She might only have the belt on Raw for another week or two. Um, I was really bummed when I saw that the open challenge was supposed to be answered on Monday by Tegan Knox, but then plans changed right before Raw, they put her on main event instead, and they had fucking Natalia come out. Listen, Natalia's good and all, she's been around for 15 years, 16 years, and I just can't, I just don't care about Natalia. We've also seen Becky and Natalia a million times. Like, I'd rather see something new, like Becky and Tegan Knox. Would people have cared if Tegan Knox came out? I'm sure they wouldn't have. But listen, you're not going to get these people over if you don't put them on the show. I, I would like to see matches like that, whether it be Becky and, Becky and Tegan, Becky and Indy, who is a former NXT Women's Champion and never got her rematch because she had the title taken away from her a couple of months ago. That would make sense. Indy coming out challenging for the championship that she was never beaten for earlier this year would make sense. You could do her and Candice. Like, give me fresh matches. I know, but at the same time, though, I wouldn't just do main roster people. It would be cool if you had people from NXT that weren't, you know, super low on the totem pole. Like, I don't give a fuck about Kiana James coming out, but like Cora Jade, uh, Roxanne Perez, Blair Davenport, any of those people coming out on Raw and answering the open challenge would be cool. They're not going to win, probably, but that would still be cool to give them the exposure championship gets exposure. If you want to see more of her opponent, whether it be Blair or Roxanne or Cora, whoever, you could tune in on Tuesdays to see more of them. So I actually really like that idea. Um, I was batting around this idea yesterday with Randy Cruz, but I was thinking, what if they had, I mean, I'm not saying they should do this, but again, just an idea. What if Jade Cargill debuted on Raw, but winning the NXT Women's Championship? So she made her debut in WWE on the main roster, but she immediately goes to NXT for more seasoning, which she probably needs. Not probably, she does. Um, if she goes right to the main roster, I wouldn't be overly upset. Just because she was already... I mean, AEW isn't what WWE is, but, you know, still, she wrestled prime time there for like two or three years. So it's not like she has no experience. She could use some tuning up in the ring and whatnot in NXT and use that as her stepping stone as what it's intended to be developmental. Um, but I think it'd be cool if she actually came out, beat Becky for the title, and then took the title to NXT, and then that was her grand debut. So it's like, if you want to see more of this woman from AEW, or even if you don't know her at all and you're just impressed, watch on Tuesdays. That's probably what I would do, but that's probably also unlikely. Uh, next question, also from Noel: should Roxanne Perez turn heel or just stay on the path that she's on? 
Um, again, I don't know if this has anything to do with what happened last night on NXT, because like I said, I have not watched the show yet. Um, I think I saw that there was a backstage segment with her and Roxanne, with Becky and Roxanne on NXT. That might be what you're referring to. I wouldn't turn her heel. Um, she's a natural baby face. She should be called up as a baby face. She, could she get a heel run in before she gets called up? Yeah. Um, but they already have Blair. They have Tiffany. Unless one of those women are getting called up soon, Roxanne would just be another... They have Cora Jade as well when she comes back uh, on the Sooner side, unless she's already back and I just wasn't aware. But they don't need to turn Roxanne heel. They really don't. They have Kiana James who they're building up, so um, no, I would not turn her heel. Christopher L. from Facebook, uh, his first question was, what are your top five favorite submission finishers of all time? I don't know if I have a top five, but here's a weird answer for you. I've always really, really liked the CM Punk Anaconda Vice. It is not a fancy finisher, but I think the reason why I always liked it was that it was such a practical finisher for anyone to do, like if you're wrestling your friend or your fucking brother or something like that, which is what I always used to do when I would do that shit. The Endicon device was always very easy to lock in, and it's effective. So when I was doing MMA more consistently years ago, that was always like my go-to move, and I would win a lot of, um, when I say MMA, I'm talking not like UFC-style shit, but like more grappling, submission-based sort of stuff. And uh, I would use that as a go-to move, and it would work. It won me a lot of different matches, so... um, I love the Anaconda device. That would probably be my go-to answer. The Sleeper's a classic. You know, Walls of Jericho. Never really looked like it hurt that much. I mean, if you apply it properly, it does. And I'm sure we've always... We've all tried that on our brother or our friend at one point, I'm sure. Um, that, you know, the Sharpshooter's a classic. That's a nice one as well. The Armbar, the Kimura. Like, I like all that stuff. My my favorite would probably be Punk's Anaconda device, though, just because I always liked how that looked and how it felt whenever I would lock it in on someone when I was doing MMA more consistently. Um, his second question. AW Dynamite is on its way to its fourth anniversary the night after Wrestle Dream, which already feels like a hot show with Brian Danielson versus Zack Sabre Jr. Even though it has not been perfect and it's had its cold periods here and there, there is no denying the impact that AEW has made on the wrestling business and how overall fun it is to just have another product on a big TV channel. My question is, what are your top 10 favorite Dynamite moments from 2019 through 2023? Uh, good question. Top 10, I have no idea. I mean, top 10 is such a, that's a big number. But among my favorite moments in the last 10 years, 10 years, in the last four years, um, that first show, there was a certain buzz around it, like, what is this going to look like? How is it going to differentiate from WWE? That first show was very fun. The first Grand Slam with Brian Danielson and Kenny Omega before the bell even rang. I'm pretty sure there was a holy shit moment. Um, that was on Dynamite. I would say Punk's debut, but that was on Rampage. So, you're saying specifically Dynamite moments. Dynamite moments. Honestly, that first COVID show will always stand out to me as one of the best shows they've ever done. Ironically enough, because there was no one in the building, but like they had the Brody Lee debut on that show and the Matt Hardy debut, and both were incredibly well done. The Matt Hardy one had been rumored for a while. The Brody Lee one was also rumored, but it was the culmination of that big Dark Order angle they were doing, um, and it was a really good reveal. So that that's one of both of those moments on that same show are among my favorite Dynamite moments. Speaking of Brody Lee, the entire memorial show they did for him later on that year in 2020. Uh, terrible circumstances, obviously, but, you know, probably the best tribute, one of the best tribute shows I've ever seen. Um, that Not a lot of moments from COVID itself. The Sting debut in early December of 2020 was awesome. Uh, that's one of my favorite moments. That was very well done. A lot of the AW debuts have happened on pay-per-view and not on Dynamite itself. Um, but there have been a lot of great debuts. I'm trying to think of what else. That first Dynamite back in front of fans in the summer of 2021 with the Malachi Black debut, him attacking Cody and Arn Anderson, was awesome. That might be another one of my favorite debuts because I didn't know it was happening. Um, I had heard a rumor it could happen, but it was so close after he got released, everyone thought he had a 60-day non non-compete or a 90-day non-compete, and it ended up being 30 because he was still signed to an NXT deal at that point. So it kind of slipped through the cracks and he was able to debut that night, which was awesome. Um, I'm trying to think of last year. Like, I was a big fan of the Punk period when he was on the show. Um, that first 
interaction between him and MJF two years ago in late 2021 was awesome. That whole feud was great, but specifically, um, you know, specifically that first face to face and that first promo exchange, I think on Thanksgiving Eve in 2021. Again, I'm thinking of 2022 because last year was such a weird year for AEW with the the highs and the lows and whatnot. Um, And even this year as well, it's been all over the place. I'm trying to think of what else really comes to mind as being my favorite, like among my favorite Dynamite moments. Adam Page coming back to win that ladder match, uh, the number one contender's uh, casino ladder match back in 2021 was also a great moment. Um, The Adam Page Dark Order, the entire Adam Page arc from 2021 when he was chasing the world championship specifically that year was great um the entrance with the dark order i I don't give a fuck about the dark order now but um it was really well done in in the summer of 2021 with him in the dark order and then he lost that night that 10-man tag team match but it was a great entrance and a really good match yeah those are the ones that really stand out i don't have a you know solidified set top 10 but those would come to mind Uh, for whatever reason, I'm blanking on last year and this year. I just don't feel like Dynamite was overly great from last year to this year. And there's been some really cool moments, like Jeff Hardy debuting last year. Um, that was really fun. The Kenny Omega heel turn and title win on the same show that Sting debuted, the first Winter is Coming show back in 2020 was awesome. Um, that stands out to me as being one of the best AEW moments on, on Dynamite. Yeah, those are the ones that really stand out, I think. Um, his next question, I absolutely love the storyline between Adam Cole and MJF solely because it keeps the audience guessing on who's going to be the one to turn. It also works in that both men are so naturally over and can be, can be tremendous heels that the turn would be huge. How do you see both turns taking place and where? I'm still hoping Adam Cole's the one to turn. I I thought it would happen at all in, but they're really stretching this out and not in a bad way. And that's okay because they've stumbled upon something great with these two and making them a tag team, and having that be a thing for a while. I don't think we get the turn tonight. Um, I don't think Cole cost MJF the world championship. I would think Cole would want the world title, so why would he cost him the world? I mean, I would love if Samoa Joe became a champion. I think that'd be awesome. I don't think that's going to happen, though. Um, Not by a long shot. But the rematch, I mean, I guess Joe could win, and people have said maybe Cole takes it from Joe, and then MJF has to chase Adam Cole, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of storyline potential there. Um, but still, I think it, it would it would be cool if they went that route. I don't think we're getting the turn anytime soon. They might have to wait a little bit longer on it. I'm still hoping Cole is the one to turn on MJF. If it's MJF turning heel, then Cole looks like a fucking idiot for not seeing it coming because the guy has turned on everyone. As has Adam Cole. But Adam Cole, in AEW anyway, I mean, I guess he was a heel initially when he came in. And he has turned on people. But still, I feel like MJF has done that so much. That's like his character. M- Adam Cole, rather, you don't really see it as much, and he was the babyface going into their initial program earlier this year. So, I wouldn't do that personally. I would not have MJF be the one to turn heel. I would still have it be Cole, and have him backed up by Roderick Strong in the kingdom. I would have that be like the new kingdom, the new undisputed kingdom, whatever you want to call it. Maybe throw in Kyle O'Reilly when he's ready to come back, which I don't know when he's ready to come He's been gone for a long, long time. He might not be ready to come back for a while. Um, but yeah, still, that that's what I would do. When it would go down, I honestly don't know. Maybe full gear? It might be even closer to like 2024. That sounds weird, but they could get a lot more mileage out of this Cole and MJF story where they're not really feuding or having matches against each other until after the run as a tag team is over, which might not be for a while. And I know I've criticized AEW before for stretching things out and having them wear out their welcome this might end up being a case of that, but I'm not feeling that fatigue yet. It's the best thing going in the entire company, aside from Tony Storm. She's doing great work right now. Um, but I think they can get a lot more, a few more months out of this. I wouldn't have said that like two months ago, but they're doing so well, and they're incorporating other characters into the angle, like Samoa Joe, where they've kept it interesting from week to week. And I honestly, I think MJF is winning tonight, but there is a small chance Joe could walk out as champion and there's a couple different directions they can go in from there as well. So, I'm loving the angle as well. I completely agree. When the ultimate turn happens, it will be huge. And the longer they wait, I mean, I don't want to say the longer they wait, the bigger it'll be. That is true. But if you wait like fucking five years, it's like, all right, it should have happened four years ago. No shit. Um, but still, I would have, I would rather wait until 
prime time when it really feels like it would make sense. All in made sense, but since they missed that, and that's okay, because there's more story to tell there, uh, the next point in which it would make sense might not be until next year, so only time will tell. His next question here, also from uh, from Chris. Uh, for the last several weeks, I have thought long and hard as to why I feel lukewarm towards the NXT product. While there are acts that I love, like the Creed Brothers, Braun Breaker, Drew Gulak, and his little catch point like group, even though Damon Kemp is a great athlete, he's painfully bland, um, he said. Chase U, Ilya Dragunov, and Thea Hale hanging with JC Jean, and the matches are good to great. There are still a lot of dull characters, overly wordy promos that make them sound inauthentic and robotic, booking decisions that either make no sense or are just idiotic, and talent that have no business being on TV like Von Wagner, Lash Legend, and Baron Corbin. Uh, that's so funny. We have a Baron Corbin hate comment after what we just talked after what we just talked about earlier. He went on to say, uh, "Too often the show feels uneven and boring. Say what? Uh, say you would be given six months as the head booker of the show. What changes would you make? My first one is to connect Becky Lynch with Lyra Valkyria and make Becky her mentor, since both are Irish and Lyra has spoken glowingly of her. What about you? Um, that's a pretty good." Idea, actually. That's not a bad idea at all. That's actually, I would I would definitely do that. Because it could help get Lyra more over, maybe put her on Raw as well. Again, I, I don't know if I would what I would do if I was the booker of NXT. I don't hate NXT as much as it sounds like that you do. Um, I agree with a lot of the acts that you enjoy. I enjoy that too. I mean, it sounds like there's a lot about the show. I mean, you said you feel lukewarm. You don't hate the NXT product. You said that. I mean, there's a lot of people that you said that you liked and stuff that you like. Uh, Von Wagner has grown on me. I don't give a fuck about the guy really, but the whole tables thing is better, has made him better and more bearable. Lash Legend, at least, is in a group. Um, she's not good, but, you know, listen, she's not being pushed on her own like she was a couple of years ago. That was terrible when she was in there with, like, fucking, uh, Nikita Lyons and they were having their program. That was awful. The show, this is probably the best the show has been since it turned to NXT 2.0 two years ago. It'll never be what it once was. We've talked about this before. People thinking, oh, we got to get it back to being a third brand. It is not a fucking third brand. It is still developmental. I would bring in some more people because they've called up a lot of people. And they've also called people up from level up. But we don't see them again after that. Like, they had that guy Oba Femi or whatever his name was on that spring break-in show months ago. And we haven't seen him since. Danny Palmer they brought in. She's just a jobber. Um, the tag team that's with scripts, they haven't really done much. I mean, it's a good idea to put them with him because he was already on the show, and it's like, oh, okay, you have a little faction here. NXT's got a lot of factions. That's fine. Get rid of Schism, first of all. That group fucking sucks. Like, how would I fix the show? Get rid of them. They're fucking awful. Um, don't fire them, I'm saying. I'm just saying get rid of the group. The dyad's gone, apparently. So just break off Ava. I mean, Ava Rain also does not belong on TV. The thing with The Rock's daughter is, is that her presence has improved, like her mic skills have improved, but in the ring, she's still fucking awful. Like, how is she even allowed to, I mean, I guess she won't get better unless she works, but like, I'm assuming she's having matches at the house shows that NXT does, but it's like, she's just not good. I don't know. Um, there's a lot of people, men and women, that don't belong in the show, they're just not that good. But listen, it's developmental. And here's another thing, I would take the show off of USA Network. Because it's not, it should not be a two-hour show, and it should not be on television. The problem is that that's not going to happen. With the ratings being higher than they've been in years for that show, with Becky being on, Rollins being on, the Judgment Day being on, and all these other characters, <clears throat> the whole point of that is to boost the ratings of the show, to make it more appealing for NBC, USA, whatever, to keep the show around, when it comes time for their media negotiations and it kind of comes with the package deal with Raw, maybe SmackDown, whatever. They're not getting rid of NXT as a, as a two-hour show, probably on USA. They might move from USA, maybe, I don't know, I don't think so, but um, that's the reason why they're doing this. And it's working. The ratings are up. Will they be up long-term after fucking Becky Lynch isn't there and the judgment they aren't there and whatever? That remains to be seen. And I don't like that they're putting all their belts. They have two titles, two top titles right now on main roster talent. I'm not a big fan of that personally. But the matches have been better. The storylines have been better. I'm not saying the show is great. But to me, I find myself enjoying NXT more now than it was six months ago or even a year ago. They're doing a better job of 
making the show more bearable so it doesn't just feel like developmental. It'll never be what it once was. It won't be. And I like Baron Corbin, too. I mean, you said you don't like him on the show. I mean, he's there to help other people out, have matches with them, which I think is working. He's been better, so I don't really agree on that one. There are people on the show I think are just fucking awful or should not be on the show, like you said. But to me, those are minor criticisms. Like, that's what developmental is, and they kind of need to, you know, clean that up and whatever. But it's also a place where you try new things with people and with concepts. They've tried a lot of new things with the match gimmicks and stuff like that, new characters, new gimmicks. Some shit works, a lot of shit doesn't work. And usually they pivot and move away from it if it doesn't. Schism, they never did. Schism sucks. Um, but there's a lot of other acts that they have moved away from or ditched, like the scripts bullshit with the fucking mask and that trash, because it sucked. They moved away from that because it was awful. Um, among other people, they would tone... Like, Lash Legend was all over the show. When NXT was first rebranded, she was all over the show. She's barely on the show now. And if she is, it's a part of the group where she's not really wrestling that much. So, again, they're making the proper adjustments. Some of the goofy stuff I could do away with, like... It, again, it's better now than it was two years ago. But, like, the Von Wagner thing where they wanted you to think that Braun Breaker killed the guy and they cut to black, that was a bit goofy. I wasn't a big fan of that. They do a lot of that shit, or, uh, you know, pretty often. Um, I would move away from that. I would mo- call some people. Like, Braun Breaker should not be on the show at this point. Like, he should be on the main roster. The Creeds, at this point, should be on the main roster. But I think, for the most part, they do a good job of making the most of who they have bringing people in from the main roster who aren't doing anything on Raw and SmackDown, and usually using them, and not making them losers, but using them to benefit the talent that are already on NXT, giving them more experience and more exposure on the main roster. I'm liking what NXT is doing right now. Again, that's not the best show by any means of AEW and in WWE. I'm not going to, I don't, I never even really watch NXT live. I typically watch it on Wednesdays. So that tells you all that you need to know as far as, is it a must-see program for me? No, it's not. Um, but it's also a developmental show that really shouldn't be on TV, so what do you really expect? So, again, I can't say what else I would specifically do as the booker, but I like that idea that you pitched. I do. Um, I think they tried to take stuff that isn't working and do their best to make it work, or just take it off the show. Typically, that is the case. I don't think Shawn Michaels is a dumb guy. And usually the live events do deliver. Like, I'm talking about, like, the live specials they do. Do more of those. They're getting those back on the road. That's a step in the right direction. Again, it should not be a third brand. It'll never be a third brand again. It'll be developmental until the day those doors close. But they can make the most of it with what they've been doing lately. I'm not saying continue everything they're currently doing, but I do think they're doing a much better job of making the show more interesting, mixing in better matches, better workers, and hopefully at some point introducing new people from the outside. That's another thing I would like to see them go back to. Dragon Lee was someone they hired and popped up on NXT within a couple of months. Give me, you know, people like him, Brian Pillman Jr., um, Casey Navarro, you know, Richard Holiday, I heard was at the tryout the other day. Nick Aldis, I think, would be on the main roster. I mean, he should not be in NXT, but Jade Cargill could use more seasoning. Um, You bring main roster people to NXT, and that's great, but I would like to see them bring people in that they hire, like free agents and shit, to NXT like it was you know, years ago. Maybe not as many indie people, but they could still benefit from bringing more of those people in, hiring more people, and putting them on NXT, in my opinion. At Iwagu91, their first question was, um, do you think that Brian Danielson versus Will Ospreay will happen this year or next year? Um, Definitely not this year. I mean, there's only three months left in 2023. I I don't think we see Will Ospreay again on the show until 2024. He's probably busy with New Japan stuff anyway, with Wrestle Kingdom. They might, I mean, could they do Danielson and Osprey Wrestle Kingdom? Yeah, it's very possible. And they can have Osprey on Dynamite before then to set it up. But you're asking, when would we see the match? This year or next year? I do think we will get the match at some point. Even if it happens at Wrestle Kingdom, that's still in 2024. So, I'm thinking next year for sure. Uh, it's not a guarantee we get that match, but how the fuck do you not book before Danielson goes away as a special attraction, how do you not book Danielson and Osprey? It has to happen. Uh, do you think that Gunter versus Chad Gable will happen again at Survivor Series? It could. I'm thinking the Rumble. Uh, maybe it's just because I've seen a lot of other people say that and like the idea of Gunter dropping the belt early on in the show to Gable 
and then coming back at the end of the show and winning the Men's Royal Rumble. I just fucking love that idea. Um, a la Becky Lynch in 2019. I just really like that idea. So I'm on board with that one. Survivor Series just might be too soon. We're probably getting Gunter and Ciampa at Fastlane, which is great. If, even if it's not at that pay-per-view, we're definitely getting that soon. And that's awesome. But I wouldn't go right back to Gable. I feel like that's that's in two months. You would have to start building it up in early November. Give it a bit more space, like four months until the Rumble. That's what I would do anyway. Um, I feel like that would be the best route to take. And then you can do it at the Rumble and give Gable the belt there. There are other people on Raw that Gunter can defend against um, until then. And that Raw mid-card or in the main event scene, whatever. So, um, yeah, I, Survivor Series would be fine in Chicago. And then Gunter can still win the Royal Rumble if they want. But I think waiting until the Rumble or at least in January would give Gable more time to chase and kind of give people the chance to rally behind him, give him a lot of time to go on a losing streak before bouncing back in a couple months. So that's what I would do. His third question here, uh, your thoughts on the current direction of MJF. I'm, I'm digging it. Like I said, I'm, I'm liking babyface MJF right now, the current storyline with Adam Cole, keeping it interesting with um, Samoa Joe in the mix. We don't know how it's going to end. We don't know where they're going next, and that's the best part about it. Him himself, MJF specifically, has played his role extremely well um, as a babyface, to the point where if Cole's the one to turn heel, and I think he should be, I think MJF would work, and I would not have said this three or, three to six months ago. I think MJF would work as the top babyface in AEW. Now that Punk's gone, the Elite are you know kind of doing their own thing on their own. Uh, I think he would work as the top babyface of the company, and you can have Adam Cole as the top heel, as the world champion with MJF chasing. So um, I think what they're doing right now is great, and even if he was to go back to being a heel, he's a natural heel, he's a better heel, he's an organic heel, so I wouldn't be upset with that either. But, yeah, I'm digging what they're doing right now. It's He's had a great run as M, as AEW World Champion, but this is definitely the best storyline he's had so far as champion. And it's the most invested I've been in MJF during this run, which is saying something, because, again, he's been the best part of the product for years now. But right now, specifically, he's got the best thing going in the company with Adam Cole in a storyline that people were not expecting to be great. The CM Punk stuff, people expected to be great. People expected the... Brian Danielson Iron Man match to be great. No one expected Cole and MJF to be more than a fucking filler feed for MJF before he moved on to bigger opponents. And uh, he's really exceeded all expectations, and I'm very excited to see where they go next. Last question from at noob underscore n underscore co TV. Uh, with Jay Uso being on Raw, who is being traded to SmackDown? It's obviously Cody Rhodes, because we all know that Cody's protecting Jay from the bloodline ever since SummerSlam. So is it going to be Cody to smack him to confront Roman Reigns? I mean, that's still my guess. Uh, the weird thing is that, so Cody gave his explanation as to why he brought Jay to Raw this past Monday. And he said it was because, like you said, he wanted to protect him from the bloodline, give him a second chance, blah, blah, blah. You would think that was also where they would say, hey, I'm, I'm going to SmackDown. From a realistic standpoint, from like... From a booking standpoint, they might not want to do that because they want to hold off until like the Rumble or until next year to kind of throw that in there. Um, someone still needs to be drafted. I mean, I don't know why, from from a storyline standpoint, it would take so long for SmackDown to get someone in return. It's like, hey, listen, we gave you Jay Uso pretty fucking quickly. Give us someone now. Why would we wait until January, realistically? But on the show, Cody has a little more to do on Raw before leaving, like with the Judgment Day and the Jey Uso stuff, so, and possibly with Drew McIntyre. They might not want to pull that trigger right now. So that's probably why. Um, but again, if it's not Cody, I'm not really sure who else it would be. Like, I don't think The Miz is a fair trade. Um, Jey Uso was one of the most over guys on SmackDown. He was a pretty big star, and I would not have said that a year ago. But... With Cody Rhodes, he's the equivalent. Like, unless it's Rollins, who's not going to SmackDown and shouldn't at this point, I'm not really sure who else that would be. Like, you're not sending fucking, you know, Chad Gable to SmackDown. That's not a fair trade. Not that WWE wouldn't do that. They don't give a fuck. But, like, realistically, it just doesn't make sense. So, I would still have it be Cody, but I would... Uh, again, realistically, it doesn't make sense as to why it would take this long for him to go to SmackDown. They just don't want to rush into him and Roman Reigns right now if they're not doing it until Mania. But no one else really makes more sense to go to SmackDown than Cody Rhodes. Unless he's winning the Rumble on Raw and then going to SmackDown anyway, and that would be kind of a waste at that point, just trade him to SmackDown. Um, that's what I would do. I mean, they've had people from Raw appear on SmackDown anyway. 
So it doesn't even really matter and vice versa with the Miz and Knight program being a prime example. I get that. But him going to SmackDown in exchange for Jay would give him the excuse to go to Friday nights. I'm just not sure when they do it. Probably after Survivor Series or around the Rumble would be my guess. And that does it, guys, for episode 512 here today of Hashtag Ask GSM, September 20th, 2023. Thank you guys for checking out the show. I appreciate it. Be sure to like the video, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more daily content. Uh, great questions as always. Thank you so much for checking out the show. Supporting the show means a lot to me. Enjoy Grand Slam tonight. I'll be looking forward to it, watching live for the first time in a while. Have a great week, guys. I'm Graham GSM Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.